Today we're going to talk about pregnancies of unknown location or what we call PULs. PUL is defined as a patient with a first trimester pregnancy who has had a um, positive pregnancy test and that could be uh, a urine or quantitative um, serum test and has had an ultrasound that shows no um, IUP and then no obvious evidence of an ectopic pregnancy. So I think the first thing that we need to look at is what is the definition of an IUP and making sure that we all understand what we're talking about when we discuss patients I think is of critical importance. So when we talk about an IUP we are discussing patients who have an intrauterine gestational sac and either a yolk sac or a fetal pole. When we talk about a diagnosed ectopic on, preg on ultrasound, we are talking about an anexal mass with a cystic structure that has a gestational sac and either a yolk sac or um, fetal pole as well. And so if you use these definitions of intrauterine pregnancy and ectopic pregnancy, what you realize is that there are lots of things that are in between. There's also a discrepancy between what we define as an IUP and an ectopic between Europe and the United States. What I've given you here are the US definitions. In Europe, the definitions are a little bit different where with an IUP you just need to have um, a gestational sac to call that an IUP. And for an ectopic, you need to have what's called um, a donut sign. And a donut sign is just a cystic structure in the um, anexa or you can have what we call the blob sign which is really just a complex mass in the anexa that is um, basically uh, highly suspicious for ectopic pregnancy but if we use the US definition then what we come up with is a lot of pregnancies that really don't fit that definition of an, a definitive IUP or a definitive ectopic. So in other words, there are lots of different pati patients that are in between. So if you have a true pregnancy of unknown location where you have a normal adnexa and a normal uterus with no intrauterine fluid collections, then that is definitely a pregnancy that you'll want to follow. And if the patient's having signs or symptoms of abnormal first trimester pregnancy, then it's going to be really important to make sure you follow that patient. Now, you could clinically decide 
that there are patients who are probably um, having an ectopic pregnancy. So a probable ectopic. And then there are going to be patients where you say, well, this is probably an IUP. And it might not be a viable IUP, but it's probably an IUP. And this is where I think the European definitions come in when we talk about probable IUPs and probable ectopic pregnancies. So what you have to understand is that you can move from one diagnostic category to the other. You can even change your diagnosis over time as the patient's clinical situation changes. So you get my drift here where ultimately the patients do not stay a pregnancy of unknown location. Okay, Ultimately patients with pregnancy of unknown location end up being resolved into another category. So what do we do when we have a patient with a pregnancy of unknown location? Uh, the patient has presented with signs or symptoms of abnormal first trimester pregnancy. Um, she has had an ultrasound that is not diagnostic for an IUP and not diagnostic for an ectopic pregnancy. So we've already established that these are patients that are symptomatically not worrisome because if the patient comes in and is symptomatically worrisome then of course we're going to have to treat that patient uh, accordingly. She may need operating room time for either DNC or laparoscopy or both. So we've got our patient now who we've already deemed as clinically stable and we've already decided that she doesn't need to go to the operating room tonight. So when we have this pregnancy of unknown location, then now we're going to get a quantitative beta HCG. Once we get that quant, then it's going to either be above the discriminatory zone or below the discriminatory zone. And by discriminatory zone, what I mean is where, what range of quantitative beta HCG values would we expect to see a definable intrauterine pregnancy. And if you read the literature, basically what you learn is that this discriminatory zone is different for each institution. And that there are many publications on what the discriminatory zone is at their institution. So some facilities have published discriminatory uh, cutoffs at 1500. But the problem with that is if you require a patient to have a diagnosable IUP at 1500, then you're going to miscategorize a large number of intrauterine pregnancies that are normal or maybe even miscarriages but these are pregnancies that are going to be considered abnormal pregnancies when indeed they are not. If you make your discriminatory zone too high, then what's going to happen is you're going to have patients that don't have diagnosable IUPs or specifically diagnosable ectopic pregnancies. However, you're going to end up waiting in order to appropriately categorize that patient. And so by setting a very high cutoff to determine that value at which you must see an intrauterine pregnancy or call the pregnancy abnormal, then you will misclassify uh, a number of ectopic pregnancies as potentially normal pregnancies and you will fail to act on a pregnancy that very well might have needed your intervention. The other thing about discriminatory zones is that they're very specific for each institution and so the real 
important um, situation is to, at your institution, look at your um, machinery, your equipment, your ultrasonographers, and your physicians and based on laboratory values that have been done in those patients and ultrasound findings, determine what your own discriminatory zone is.